Black holes are one of the most mysterious and intriguing objects in the universe. The name is appropriate because first, it is black, meaning that it absorbs all the light coming in and does not reflect anything back. It's a hole because it's as if it's a puncture in the fabric of space-time. The space inside the event horizon does not behave anything like empty space. But in 1974, Stephen Hawking theorized that a black hole may not be so black after all. His calculations showed that when you apply the laws of quantum mechanics to the classical physics that had defined our understanding of black holes, you find that they shine, they emit radiation, they give off photons. But how is this possible, given that black holes can only absorb light? And if it can't reflect light, then where are these photons coming from? How do they get created? Surely these photons could not be coming from nothing, or can they? The explanation is coming up right now. The gravity around a black hole is so strong that it had been thought that nothing could escape from it, including light. If we ignore quantum mechanics, then in classical physics, the mass of a black hole cannot decrease. It can either stay the same or get larger, because nothing can escape a black hole but things can fall in so it can gain mass that way, but things can't escape from it. If mass and energy are added to a black hole, then its radius should also get bigger. If the radius gets bigger, then its surface area will get large as well, according to the equation A equals 4 pi r squared. This is just the formula for the surface of any sphere. For a black hole, the r in the equation is called the Schwarzschild radius and this radius is proportional to the mass of the black hole, according to this equation. To Stephen Hawking and others, this idea that the surface area staying the same or increasing looked very similar to the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics states that in any natural process, the entropy of a closed system always increases or remains constant. It never decreases. So Hawking postulated an analogous theorem for black holes, and it is called the second law of black hole mechanics. And it says, in any natural process, the surface area of the event horizon of a black hole always increases or remains constant. It never decreases. So now you can see the parallels with the second law of thermodynamics regarding entropy. And similar to the second law, there are also ways to state the other three laws of thermodynamics in a way that are true for black holes as well. The analogy with the laws of thermodynamics suggests that perhaps black holes are physically a thermal body. In thermodynamics, there is something called a black body. A black body is something that doesn't transmit or reflect any radiation. It only absorbs radiation. So analogously, a black hole is something that also doesn't transmit or reflect any radiation. It only absorbs it. If a black hole can be thought of as a black body from thermodynamics, then it must have a temperature associated with it, because a black body in thermodynamics always has a temperature. But if it has a temperature, it must shine in some way. But now we have a conundrum, because according to classical physics, a black hole is not supposed to release anything. Stuff can only go in. No stuff is supposed to come out. So how do we reconcile these two thoughts? When Stephen Hawking saw these ideas, he found the idea of shining black holes to be preposterous. He set out to prove why they would not shine. But when he applied the laws of quantum mechanics to general relativity, he found the opposite to be true. He realized that stuff can come out near the event horizon of a black hole. And in 1974, he published a paper where he outlined a mechanism for this shine. So what was the mechanism he outlined that would allow black holes to emit photons? So the simplest explanation is this. All of space is teeming with virtual particles that come in and out of existence all the time and everywhere. This is based on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. One version of the uncertainty principle can be written as the following. Delta E times delta T is greater than or equal to H, which is Planck's constant, over 4 pi. So basically what this equation says is that the uncertainty in energy and uncertainty in time are inversely proportional to each other because the product of the two is equal to a constant. In other words, if you know very precisely the energy of a system, then you can't know the time over which you made that measurement very well, or vice versa. You can know the time very well, but not the energy. But what this equation also tells you is that you can get particles with an energy delta E 
and if it occurs over a very short period of time, delta T, such that the product of the two is less than Planck's constant over 4 pi, that is, particles can exist that violate this uncertainty principle. How is this possible? Well, this is one of the crazy things about quantum mechanics. Violations are allowed, but it's as if by not obeying this Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the universe really doesn't register or record its existence because no measuring device would ever be able to measure this directly. A particle with some finite energy, as long as the change in time is very small, can exist. So what's happening is particle-antiparticle pairs borrow energy from the present and give it right back in the future by annihilating themselves. This is how virtual particles are formed in empty space, and space is teeming with them. This is also called the quantum foam. You might ask, if we can't measure it, how the heck do we know that it actually is happening? Well, it does affect the universe in ways that are measurable. For example, it manifests as a force in something called the Casimir effect in which the quantum foam outside a set of two plates is greater than the pressure inside the plates, and this creates a force pushing the plates together. So this virtual particle creation annihilation does really exist and is a central part of quantum mechanics. The severe curvature of space-time near the event horizon of a black hole disturbs this quantum foam in ways that you don't see in normal empty space, as neutrinos and antineutrinos and electrons and positrons and other particle-antiparticle pairs get created Sometimes when two of these particles are close to the event horizon, one particle can get sucked into the black hole before the two particles have a chance to annihilate each other. This kind of capture and release by the black hole can happen anywhere in the space around the event horizon, outside it as well as inside it. If the partner is left outside, it will no longer have a partner with which to annihilate, so it will remain and escape from the black hole. This particle will be carrying energy with it. This is what we perceive as Hawking radiation outside the black hole, and this is how a black hole shines. Where does this energy of the escape particle come from? From our perspective outside the black hole, the particle we got is positive, but this means that the black hole got a particle which has negative energy. In other words, the black hole lost energy. This is the same thing as losing mass because of the mass energy equivalence of Einstein's famous equation equals mc squared. So virtual particles are created in space by borrowing energy, but ultimately, so that nothing violates the law of energy conservation, the energy of the shine is really coming from the mass of the black hole. So this is the popular way to think of Hawking radiation, but it has some problems. I think the biggest problem with this is that the radiation from the black holes is not in all different wavelengths, as would be expected with this mechanism. The radiation actually has a wavelength equal to about the size of the black hole. So smaller black holes emit shorter wavelengths or more energy than larger black holes. So a more accurate way to look at this is the following. Now this is still an approximation, but it's probably a closer approximation. In reality, there are no particles, only fields, and this is the crux of the quantum field theory. The actual Hawking calculations consider the waves coming in from infinity and being scattered or disrupted because of the black hole event horizon as it was forming. Certain vibrations of waves are deflected by the gravitational field of the black hole as it forms in the past. Some of these get distorted or even absorbed by the event horizon. Some waves don't get deflected at all. Hawking showed that the waves entering the event horizon was disrupted in a way that the wave on the other side carried away energies corresponding to the size of the black hole. Particles with waves as large as the event horizon get lost within the event horizon, so the energy we see are about as large as the event horizon. The quantum fields that have wavelengths the size of the black hole get out with more energy than they came in with, because waves that get absorbed by the black hole have to be negative energy in order for us to see the positive energy in our universe. This corresponds to an energy spectrum analogous to a black body at a certain temperature. So this is why black holes have a temperature, and this is what we perceive as Hawking radiation. But is Hawking radiation real? Can we measure it? Not directly, but Hawking found a formula for the temperature of a black hole. Note that the temperature is proportional to the reciprocal or inverse of the mass. As the black hole evaporates over time, the m in the equation becomes smaller and smaller. This means that the temperature rises as the black hole evaporates. As the black hole evaporates, its mass decreases. So the hottest black holes are the smallest one. This is why they lose energy faster. 
Now here's the interesting part, as the mass goes to zero, the evaporation rate goes to infinity. So this tells us that near the end of the evaporation process, we would see an explosion of the black hole as the mass is quickly used up. This would be seen as a burst of high energy photons, or gamma rays. The lifetime of the black hole is calculated using this equation. If you do the calculations, it means that anything with a mass less than 10 to the 15 grams would have evaporated by now. This would be tiny black holes about as massive as Mount Everest. They would only be about the size of a proton, by the way. Hawking theorized that such tiny black holes could have existed at the time of the Big Bang, but it also means that black holes slightly larger than 10 to the 15 grams would be evaporating around this time in our universe. And if this is happening, it means that we should see a bunch of gamma ray bursts. Do we detect gamma ray bursts? We absolutely do. In fact, about one gamma ray burst or GRB occurs per day. However, the pattern of gamma rays don't fit with what we would expect to see in a black hole explosion. What we see are bursts with variations in brightness from bright to dim to bright again. The black hole evaporation should look like a steady increase in luminosity from a low value to a high value until a final explosion. So these gamma ray bursts are attributed to another phenomenon, probably colliding neutron stars or explosions of supermassive stars, not evaporating black holes. So the data doesn't really support the idea that very small black holes exist, but despite the fact that no direct evidence of Hawking radiation exists, it perfectly fits with the laws of quantum mechanics and few, if any, physicists dispute its existence. Now here's what I find incredible about black hole entropy. But let's clarify what entropy is. It is a measure of the amount of disorder in a system. You can scramble an egg, but you can't unscramble it. A more disordered system like the scrambled egg has greater entropy. You need more information to describe the scrambled or disordered state. So information is also proportional to entropy. Bekenstein showed that the entropy of a black hole is defined by this equation. A is the area of a black hole, and Z is a very large constant. This means that the entropy of black holes is a huge number. A black hole of the size of the center of our Milky Way galaxy has an entropy in the order of about 10 to the 91. Now, if you take all the entropy in the universe, ignoring gravity and other black holes, I mean, take the entropy of all the matter, in stars, burning fossil fuels, all the dark matter, it would only be about 10 to the 88. So the black hole at the center of just our galaxy has almost a thousand times the entropy of the entire universe. And there are at least a hundred billion other such black holes in the universe. So almost all the entropy of the universe is contained in black holes. Anything outside black holes is negligible. And if you equate entropy with information, this should tell us that most of the information of the universe also lies within black holes. Why is this the case? What the heck is going on inside these things? Since no one can ever go inside and come back out to tell us, it's hard to say. But before you get too excited, this doesn't mean that black holes are a giant computer or brain. It's not information like in books or hard drives, but it's information that defines the various microstates of particles in a system. But it's mind-bending thoughts like this that make science really interesting. I'd like to thank my generous supporters on Patreon. If you like this video, then give us a like and write your questions in the comments because I try to answer all of them. I will see you in the next video, my friend.